welcome, welcome to BCC, Bristol Community College. As I think you probably know, because you found your way here, this is our the Wall Street facility, which houses our Workforce Education Institute. And it's just a real pleasure. I'm Paul Beacon. I work as Vice President for Workforce Development. And it's a pleasure and an honor for me to represent our president, uh, Jack Sprager, who was unable to be here today because he is participating in the uh, Board of Higher Education's effort to promote public secondary education, public secondary higher education in particular, uh, as the way to get from where you start in life to where you want to be in life as a productive member of the workforce. And I don't need to explain to anybody in this room the relationship between income and education and the value and importance of education as we move forward in this increasingly complex uh, economy and society. So on behalf of Jack Sprager, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of Bristol Community College, and on behalf of the Workforce Education Institute, uh, your host today, uh, thank you and welcome to Bristol Community College. And thank you, Madam Secretary, uh, for joining us today to bring a spotlight to uh, an issue that sometimes needs more attention, and that is the employment of workers with disabilities, right? So disabilities is a label that came from somewhere that got put on all of us. We all have various labels. Uh, but that doesn't mean we cannot be productive contributors to the workforce. And what we're here to highlight today is a really innovative uh, training program in customer service skills development for individuals who have been labeled as having some disability which limits their ability to work productively. Uh, and we're so happy to do that today uh, in conjunction with Bristol Community College's Office of Disability Services, with our colleagues at the Workforce Investment Board and the Fall River Career Center, that workforce pipeline that tries to connect people who may have <coughs> Challenges getting into the workforce or may, whose workforce may have been disrupted by family issues, whatever, military service. BCC is the connecting dot, and this program is an example of a connecting dot for a really important special population, individuals who have been labeled as disabled. Because that doesn't mean you can't work, right? And what we need as a system to do is think and talk about that as a society. And, 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 and make reasonable accommodation. That's just what everybody's asking for. Give me a chance. Accommodate my disability however you can, and I can contribute. Because why do we join an organization? Everybody wants to be whatever they can be, right? Self-actualization, I think, actually is the term for that. Everybody wants to get someplace. So today, we're building a bridge to do that for people who have great skills, great potential in the workforce, who are going to find employers who understand that, who understand that with reasonable, modest, reasonable accommodation, you can tap into a workforce that's very productive and can help you in a big way. These funds don't come from anywhere to support these programs. They come normally from legislative action, our federal delegation, and our state delegation, which is very ably and confident in that area, very ably represented today. So let me introduce you to them if you haven't already met them. I see Representative Alan Silva from Fall River. I saw him, he is hiding somewhere <coughs> behind the pole, Senator Michael Roderick. A person who I think is a member emeritus of the legislature, former Senator Menard, Joe Menard. And I think also, Someone who will join us before the end of the morning is our representative, Carol Fiola, a friend of mine, and, and I know she'll be here as well. I want to take a minute and read my notes and make sure I, I recognize the people who made this thing happen. So first of all, it starts with Carmen uh, Aguila, Adin, and Robitello, our Director of Corporate Services and their work, and <laughs> And then, of course, the specific hands-on team of Jen Vincent and Sarah Brown, and once again, our Office for Disability Services. It's a great team, uh, and I want to thank you for your efforts to bring this to reality. So, 
enough about that. I hope that set a context and gave you some things to think about yeah, sure did. because it's really a thrill to, to have with us uh, Secretary Carillion. Carillion. Am I even close? It's not, it's not bad. Caprillion. Yeah. Caprillion. Yeah. Thanks. I tried to practice four or five times. There's not a lot of Armenians in Fall River. Yeah. <laughs> She was very close to Armenia so recently. Um, but the Secretary and the Patrick administration really get these kinds of things that I was talking about. I know this Secretary has served the, the governor very well in many very, in many very disparate ways. And now she's heading up this important workforce effort for us. So without further ado, please welcome to BCC Secretary Rachel Caprelli. Thank you. Believe me, and uh, Caprillion is pronounced differently even in Armenia, so I'll answer to it in any way. Um, it is so great to be here, and uh, um, this is a great job. And the reason, there's many reasons this is a great job, but the biggest reason is when you see what funding means when it's actually implemented on the ground. And I really want to thank uh, everyone at Bristol Community College, everyone involved with this, Carmen, Robert, Nicole, uh, and Jen and Sarah, who are really, you know, the hands-on people who are on the front line of getting everybody integrated into the workforce. There is a place for everyone in the workforce to contribute. And often what you believe is more important than what you might see in front of you. Um, because how many of us know and love someone with a disability? And by the way, a third of us at some time in our life will have some kind of a disability. So we are really talking about everybody. We are talking about all of us in an inclusive workforce. So I really want to thank you uh, for inviting me here today. I want to thank my former colleagues in the legislature, Joe Menard, who I learned an awful lot from. She probably forgot more about the legislative process than I learned in the 13 years I was there. Rep Silva, who I know that we've worked together on numerous things, uh, going back to the registry of motor vehicles, but we never served in the House. Um, but I know that uh, the passion of Fall River is, uh, you know, and, and South Coast is right, right there for you. I'm in Mike Rodriguez, who was my seatmate. We sat, he sat behind me. And it's a good thing there wasn't a fly on the wall for some of the editorial comment that went back and forth between <laughs> Michael and I. But he's doing a great job in the State Senate. So it's, it was great to see all of you again and work with you again in this capacity. Um, so what we do in labor and workforce uh, the mo is basically oversee sort of these effective and innovative services uh, here on the ground at Bristol and elsewhere in the state and put people to work. Um, and I, there's going to be, in short order, more than 100,000 openings predicted in the manufacturing sector alone. With baby boomers retiring, with growth in the manufacturing industry, it is alive and well in Massachusetts and here on the South Coast. And uh, we cannot afford as a commonwealth to leave any one worker behind. We want everybody dressed, on the field, ready to play, because the jobs are there and they are necessary. Um, so one of the first things that Governor Patrick did, it's now a long time ago, uh, that he got to the, uh, to the governor's office was to issue Executive Order 478, which established the state of Massachusetts as a model employer program to promote hiring and retaining people with disabilities in our workforce. So the program was founded on the so-called Community First Principles, which is, not rocket science, partnering with business to invest in a, motiv a motivated and diversified workforce that offer private sector benefits while creating greater independence for people with disabilities. And the 1.7 million in state grants that followed last year were dedicated to training and placing more than 150 individuals with disabilities and employment and opportunities across the state. That's right, like that enthusiasm. Um, each of the seven organizations funded through these grants is working closely with community, public, and business partners to leverage local resources, provide comprehensive case management services, and support individuals in developing work readiness and occupational skills demanded by local businesses as the threshold for successful employment. And we know that businesses also need employees who are skilled, productive on the first day of employment. Job seekers who cannot demonstrate they are work ready have no chance of succeeding in this competitive work environment. By including businesses in these partnerships, we are ensuring that these are real jobs at the end of the training program. At the end of the day, there is a job you are ready and trained to do. Fifteen of the 38 individuals that will participate in the Bristol Training and Employment Program have already begun training in core customer service and healthcare and human services settings. Let me tell you, as a former state rep and as a registrar of motor vehicles, it's all about customer service. It's all about who are your customers, what do they need, and how do you best respond to what they need. 
And I am also heartened to see that additional training options like extensive job search and placement assistance have been made a part of the program, which will increase the odds that all particip participants will get a job at the end of their training. And while assigning each individual the all-important job coach will ensure that they will stay with that job. I think the key to successfully placing job seekers with specially targeted populations like individuals with disabilities, veterans, the long-term unemployed, is engaging the employers in the grant partnerships and the process. We need to work more with local and regional businesses to determine what their needs are, what the regional you know, nuances are, what kinds of skills they're looking for in their employees today and in the future to match job seekers and help their businesses grow and thrive. I say over and over again, you can't have a business solution that doesn't work for business. How do you know what business needs? You have to ask business, engage them in the process, ask them to contribute their best because we're all in this together. They need workers and workers need jobs. Last week I was at, in, in Springfield with the U.S. Department of Labor Secretary Tom Perez and he kind of aptly put what our primary job is in workforce development and labor. It's like match.com. You know, we're trying to match that individual, what, who they are, what they can do with a job that's out there. And it's very true. And last year, over 100,000 employers took advantage of our Career Center services to help them in recruiting, hiring, posting job op openings on JobQuest, which by the way is huge and free. It's monster.com and indeed, except better, uh, and free. Um, and, it, it, and by helping others avert layoffs, apply for tax credits and workforce training grants. Many were matched with the 1.6 million job seekers who came through our doors seeking job counseling, resume writing, interviewing skills, or training to meet the skills of employers we're looking for in their region. Because we've also learned, Massachusetts is not one state. It is not all the same. We are five, we're like 10 little states within one state. You know, uh, South Coast is not the Berkshires, is not Greater Worcester, is not Greater Boston. You have your own vibe, your own needs, your own employment base. And our success in Massachusetts at Labor and Workforce Development is putting people back to work after one of the worst recessions in history Lie in engaging our business and credentialing and training workers so that on the first day, the first day, the unemployed worker is prepared, getting ready to look for work, and finding that match on our giantmatch.com. And that's what these grant programs are about. It's about targeted populations, and giving them the resources to help that no part of our workforce is left behind. And again, that everybody, everybody, no matter what their skills, no matter what their perceived limits, because that's what it is, their perceived limits. It is up to us in the business community and in government to meet people where they are. Because so often, it's, a not a big, it's not a big shift. It's turning the dial a little to the right or a little to the left. And by the way, you now have an incredibly productive, grateful worker who is fully engaged in contributing to everything that we do in our society and our economy. And uh, I'm so grateful for your attention today. Thank you so much for bringing me. Love Bristol County. Love the work going on around here. And thank you uh, for getting more and more people into better jobs, better lives. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much. Right on target. Right on target. I think we're going to have a panel presentation now. Uh, we've invited uh, Tom Pereira. Up. I'm going to invite Tom Pereira up to the, to the microphone. And then he will introduce the panelists who come, I think, to line us up here. Yes. So as they're taking their seats, I'd just like to also offer my thanks to, to everybody who's made this a success. You know, when the Bristol Workforce Investment Board uh, actually applied for this grant, we did bring together a, a broad partnership of uh, agencies that serve individuals with disabilities, our local one-stop career centers, uh, employers, and other uh, government partners as well. And I'm happy to say that all four of the individuals sitting at the table here represented original partners to the grant. Um, and, uh, and also just briefly let me just say thank you to the, the folks also on the workforce side who, uh, of our of workforce development side who participated um, on, on the WIB staff, Joanna Matus out there who has been coordinating the grant for the WIB, uh, Karen Willis who is the point person over at the Fall River Career Center, though she also uh, serves individuals through the Taunton and Attleboro Career Center, so we would have a wide uh, broad regional participation in the grant. And of course, uh, the funding is important, so I also thank the state legislators 
um, uh, who actually make this funding you know, available to us. So with that being said, um, let me just introduce who I have here. Um, to my immediate left here is uh, Patricia Emsalem, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Stanley Street Treatment and Resources, better known in our city as STAR. Uh, STAR is a nonprofit health care and social service agency that provides a wide range of mental health and substance abuse treatment services to people throughout the communities of southeastern Mass and Rhode Island. All of their substance abuse and mental health programs are licensed by the Mass Department of Public Health and Department of Mental Health uh, and, and Hospitals in Rhode Island. So, uh, and Patricia, I would have to say, Pat has been a longtime partner uh, with the WIB in many of its initiatives, and as an employer, I can say has hired a number of individuals uh, through the Career Center over the years, um, and we're also working right now with them on a grant, the Healthcare Workforce Transformation Fund grant, which hopefully will get funded, and we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, for that. Uh, uh, to Pat's left is another longtime partner, uh, Bill Perkins from uh, People Incorporated. And People Incorporated is a human service agency serving the South Coast community, including the greater Florida, New Bedford, and Taunton areas. Uh, as a partnership of specialized integrated programs, they provide unique opportunities to people with life challenges. And they have been, since 1968, one of the <coughs> largest providers of supports and services to people of all abilities in the community. Uh, and then we have, uh, to Bill's left, uh, Sue Bassano, mm -hmm. who is uh, Dean of Disability yes. here at Bristol Community College. And of course, I won't say much more about the college uh, as a partner, as they are an integral partner in this grant, and we'll look forward to hearing more from Sue. And then uh, toward the end there is uh, Mitchell Zahn, who is the Area Director uh, for Fall River for the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission, one of our government partners um, that does a lot of work in placing people with individuals <coughs> Disabilities. They assist individual disabilities to live and work independently. Uh, MRC is responsible for vocational rehabilitation services, community services, and eligibility determination for SSDI and SSI, as well as other services. Uh, so, uh, longtime partner as well, in the sense that with the one stop career centers, certainly we work very much in tandem with Mass Rehab. Uh, in terms of, particularly in vocational rehabilitation services. And uh, it's with good work from his office that certainly a lot of people with disabilities have been placed uh, both through their own uh, services and through partnership with, particularly with training services through the One Stop Career Centers. So I have a series of questions that will kind of hopefully spur some thought. I'll try to leave a little bit of time as well if there's any questions from the audience. So if anybody has any burning questions as you hear the employers, certainly save them and we'll, I'll try to time it so we leave a couple minutes at the end uh, uh, for that. So first, we'd just like to kind of learn a little bit about what your workforce looks like. So basically, what are the demographics of your workforce? And then if you could speak somewhat about how many people do you have uh, with disabilities? And, uh, and also, uh, if you could also note, particularly those who have worked with disabilities, if they have, in fact, risen to supervisory positions, like how many do your senior staff might have a disability? But again, just a, a, just a general sense of the demographics uh, of your workforce, um, with, if you have some information on disabilities as well. Uh, since Pat, you're right there, we'll start with you. Thanks, Tom, and thanks for inviting me to be here, because we have worked very closely with uh, with the WIB and BCC on a number of workforce development initiatives that have proven to be very uh, helpful for STAR and for the employees. We have in Massachusetts 344 employees. 74% of those are female, 26% male. And you may know the leadership at STAR is predominantly female. Our former uh, Comptroller used to say it was a damned matriarchy. He was uh, <laughs> one of the few uh, senior males. I think we have some. We have more now. But so, in terms of hiring females as underrepresented, that's not been our problem. Um, and in terms of people that have disabilities, Secretary uh, Caprillian's description of everybody having a disability at one time or another is, I think, apt in terms of our workforce. When I think about the underemployed groups that are represented by some of the people that have contributed tremendously to STAR over the years, I'd say there's three sort of categories, and I think they overlap, and they overlap with the ADA definition of disability as well. But for our purposes, I would say people who 
have a history of addiction, people who have uh, a criminal history record, and people who have no GED or high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And we have people at the highest levels uh, who fit in those categories. If you look at the people who have <coughs> positive quarries, um, and that was, uh, I just got somebody to look that up for me on Friday, and I was a little surprised because 8.5% of our employees were hired with positive quarries. A quarter of those people have been with us more than 10 years, another quarter more than five years, and so a total of almost 50% have been with us more than five years and had, were hired with a positive quarry. Now those people usually had a history of addiction and, um, and those people have benefited from these training programs that we've had, work site training programs that have resulted in them getting certified as addictions counselors, uh, become a rise interventionists, and move up to positions that are management positions. So that's, that's one category. Another category is the people without a high school diploma. And we, didn't, we don't really know who has a high school diploma or not because at our entry level positions, we never asked that. But when we started doing training for people, we discovered that some of the people that are in key positions in our organization who have risen up through the ranks didn't have high school diplomas. And we have people who, but they are very smart. So in a city where 31% of the people over 25 don't have a high school diploma or a GED, I think as an employer we would really be hampering ourselves, restricting ourselves uh, from the talent that some of these people have um, by having that exclusion because the jobs at the entry level didn't really need that. So. I guess that's, in terms of, I guess that's really it, and I'll pass it along. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, representing People Incorporated uh, is, is a little bit different in, in the sense that um, we employ lots of people. We, put, we employ 700 people currently, um, but we also, as a, as a main function of what it is that we provide to the community, pro provide employment opportunities, uh, provide opportunities for um, people to get support in finding work. Uh, with disabilities and um, you know Tom, Tom mentioned in his introduction that People Incorporated started in 1968. Um, I, I, did, I wasn't there in 68 but, but shortly after that uh, <coughs> when, when I started to work for People Incorporated um, I was involved in helping people to find jobs um, and that was one of the first um, jobs that I had at People Incorporated and you know as, as an agency what our goal is for people is to really be successful in community integration. Um, and in my experience over 30 years now, those folks who have done, um, you know, superlative, you know, uh, in terms of becoming parts of their community are people that have done that through their employment. Um, so many people over, over the course of my career at People Incorporated, I've seen become part of not only, you know, uh, financial benefit of working, uh, but, but more important to me, actually, is the, the opportunities that they've had to uh, become part of the community, making friends, uh, having membership in other organizations that they meet. And, and you know, all of us that, you know, uh, with employment over the years um, can certainly attest to the fact that, you know, many of our relationships, um, I met my wife at my work, to be honest with you, but, uh, but many of um, uh, our opportunities to become part of our community come through employment. And that's what we hope for the folks that we support uh, at People Incorporated. As I mentioned, we have uh, upwards of 700 uh, people that work for People Incorporated. Um, and as an agency that supports people with disabilities to find jobs, we've created jobs within our organization for people with disabilities, and we have a number of those, um, quite a number actually. Uh, we have um, upwards of 30 folks that, that work in our organization um, as part of, you know, at different levels of the organization, um, one of whom is here today to talk about his uh, successes at work. Um, but that's, that's an integral part of what we provide for the community. Um, our, our business is uh, heavily um, female uh, as a human service agency, um, but you know, we, we've also hired people with disabilities um, for employment in our um, 
uh, support, uh, direct support work in, in, in our residences, in our day program. Um, it's not something that, uh, you know, when we get to uh, the issue of disclosure a little bit later, um, there are people in our organization that do have disabilities that, are, you know, it, it's not necessarily part of our planning. Uh, but uh, we're, we're aware of their disability and we're able to make accommodations for them with regard to whether it be, you know, physical restrictions or f physical limits to their work uh, or in many cases um, cognitive limits uh, where uh, Tom mentioned the idea of providing job coaching uh, before and that's uh, the, the role that we have as a, as a partner in the grant. Um, and the role of the job coach is, is crucial for a lot of folks whose um, employer may not provide the level of uh, training that they need initially to, to be successful on the job. And in a nutshell, that's the role of the job coach, um, kind of going into the workplace, assessing the culture, finding out who's important, uh, you know, who the boss is, you know, what, 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 what to say at the right time, uh, but also uh, that additional training that might be needed for someone with a cognitive disability who uh, could be very successful with, uh, on the job with just a little bit more uh, support. Uh, and that's what our role in this, in this particular grant is about. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Hi, at BCC, I am the Dean for Disability Services, and we work with almost 1,000 students in a given academic year. Um, really, Disability Services at BCC is all about access, and it's all about including the entire college community. So for any events, we try to plan an event that, so that it is in an, an accessible area and that we're also providing access to our growing deaf and hard of hearing population. Um, and today I'd like to introduce you to Genevieve Copley, who is one of our BCC interpreters, um, as well as Mary Beth Anderson, who is seated right now, but open the program as well. Um, again, at BCC, the focus is on inclusion and maximizing learning so that we minimize accommodations, the need for accommodations. Our role for the grant was primarily in the development of the curriculum with a focus on universal design for learning so that any student, regardless of ability, would be able <coughs> to learn the customer service, the leadership, the advocacy that's going on in the grant program as well. Um, we're also including, we recommended for the grant to include in classroom support services such as C-print captioning, um, mentors, tutors, and again kind of modeling the perfect learning environment for, environment for any individual. At BCC, um, about 500 of our students report their primary disability impacts on learning. And we have two very high um, increasing populations. And those are students within the autism spectrum and students who are also deaf and hard of hearing. And we've seen very large increases in those populations in the last few years. Um, last year, we had almost 800 students graduate from BCC. Our students are in every program from accounting to nursing. And we work with our students not only with classroom accommodations, but also when they go out into their clinical settings, practicum settings, or they do a cooperative education. So I welcome, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask as we progress with the panel. Good morning. Um, I'm from Mass Rehab, and Mass Rehab is a state agency that uh, works with people with disabilities to promote independence and economic self-sufficiency. Uh, I work in the Vocational Rehabilitation Division, uh, where we work with uh, people with disabilities that have some type of impediment to employment, and that might be related to their disability, lack of training, uh, whatever it is that uh, keeps somebody from participating uh, fully in the workforce. We also assist people uh, with job retention who uh, may become disabled over time due to illness, uh, maybe need hearing aids or something of that sort to uh, maintain themselves in their existing job. Um, our agency, because it works with people with disabilities, definitely 
disproportionately has uh, a large representation of people with disabilities in the uh, employment area. We have approximately, at any one point in time, about 800 employees. Uh, while I don't know the specifics of the uh, breakdowns, I do know uh, we support the governor's model employer initiative <coughs> and uh, we live it every day. Um, if, uh, in terms of management positions, we are pretty equally uh, distributed with people with disabilities, uh, male female ratios, people of color in management positions. Uh, our commissioner lives and breathes uh, diversity in the workforce, and it, uh, you can feel it throughout the entire agency. Um, I'm not sure where else to go with this right now, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll give you, I work in the Fall River office. Uh, last year, we worked with about 850 individuals from the region. We put 104 <coughs> people to work. Uh, and when we say to work, it, they must be employed for 90 days or more in their position uh, before we can say that that's been a successful employment. We can also assist people who are already employed that need some extra support, maybe uniforms or something of that sort. You can come back and get additional services once you're out in the workforce uh, after you've been uh, considered uh, terminated from service, but you can come back in. Um, we work with people with a wide range of disabilities from uh, psychiatric disabilities, physical disabilities, uh, learning disabilities, uh, so it's a very wide distribution of consumers that we serve. Uh, I again will be here for any questions. I also have some information on services if anybody is interested in uh, a little bit more uh, information after the session. Okay. Thank you so much, Mitch. Uh, and also, before I get to the next question, I did want to note that we have been joined also by uh, State Representative Paul Schmidt. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And State Representative Carol Fiola, who's also right here, which actually means that the entire uh, representatives, the representation of the Fall River delegation is here, which I think certainly shows the commitment to programs like this and state funded uh, initiatives for this type of employment work. So the next question you know, we have people in the room here from the class who are going to be, before too long, uh, looking for employment. So I'd like to kind of shift the conversation a bit to uh, a hiring process and ask you, for example, when you look at a resume, you know, what are you, what are you really looking for in terms of hires? Also on the reverse side, are there some things that people should be avoiding, uh, things that would be red flags for you in terms of a hiring process? So basically just how to most effectively uh, market yourself when you're searching employment, what you would be looking for when people are looking. I know sometimes people vary the order, but I'm going to go right back and, and do the same order since I know uh, in, in terms of Pat and, uh, uh, and Bill, a lot of the hiring process. And Bill, you know, I wanted to just follow up on one comment you made in terms of you saying even though you, your agency has a mission to serve people with disabilities, you do in fact hire many people with disabilities. And we know that because you've always been a valuable partner to different grants because oftentimes you provide a service, but you end up also being serving a dual purpose right. as an employer. Yeah, you not only do various services, but actually hire people out of the grant. So we'll start back with you, Pat, on that uh, line. The first thing I look at is um, stable work history or evidence that they actually show up for things. And the second thing is that they demonstrate that they care about getting it right. So if they don't have work experience of any kind, I mean, I'd just love to see somebody who showed up and was at the window at, at Dunkin' Donuts for five years and, you know, became a manager or something. I, no matter what the job is, no matter how high a level, that to me is, is a real strength. But short of that, say it's somebody who's trying to get into the workforce, I would be looking to see that they demonstrate that they really care, both they care about getting it right. So, you know, if there are mistakes on their resume, how much do they really care, you know? Um, you can always get help with spell check and so forth, so are you willing to go the extra mile to get it right? And that you care about people, and I think that people who have challenges in their lives tend to be, to have that, that's a that's definitely a plus, that they care, they care a lot about um, other people and people who need our help. I think that also is customer service. You know, customer service is really about 
caring and conveying that you care about the consumer. The um, Ritz Hotel chain, I heard the, the head of quality speak once at a conference, and the Ritz Hotel chain was the recipient of the International Award for Quality, the Bal Baldrige Award, and he said the single factor that was most significant in terms of their reputation for quality was that everybody that they hired, whether it was for maintenance or executive, was given a test for empathy. And they, that score, they had to score above a certain level on empathy. So I think that's certainly something that you look to and I think the population that's had difficulty finding employment probably have that more than a lot of other people. I, I would echo the comments uh, around uh, consistency in your employment. And that's that's you know typical when someone looks at a resume, looking at you know consistency in past employment experiences. But I, I really want to applaud uh, BCC and, and, and the, the, the grant team for their selection of uh, the customer service agenda and, and curriculum, because that really is you know pervasive through any employment uh, that that you're going to have. I know it's extremely important to us that people incorporated that the people that we serve are satisfied, and the, the way they become satisfied is by our employees having great customer service skills. Um, so my, my recommendation would be to you know, really um, highlight this aspect of your training uh, that BCC is, is providing for you um, in your resume, um, and, and, and you know, be able to talk about it at your interview, that you know your, your ability to um, recognize customer satisfaction and to know how to listen to people, um, to know about the social skills that are needed to, to be successful in your job, uh, is very important. Years ago, uh, when you know Fall River was more um, heavily manufacturing, you know, in terms of a, a, an employment base. Uh, we used to teach people and be concerned about particular skills they have, how fast they could do things, how, you know, uh, you know what, what their fine motor skills were like, and we talked about things like that. Now we're much more sensitive to the idea of helping people to find employment through their ability to socialize at work, through their ability to, you know, recognize um, what the social mores of, of their particular work culture is. Um, and I think you'll learn a lot about that in your customer service uh, training. And so I, I would, uh, you know, definitely recommend that you highlight that aspect in your in your resume, uh, and be able to talk about it during your interview. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Um, when we do meet with students um, to develop an accommodation plan, we look to the student to have a good understanding of their strengths and their weaknesses, and what challenges they may have in a particular course or other educational setting. Um, very often when students make the transition from high school to college, they have defaulted somewhat or, or have other advocates in their family who can't speak to them and are not fully familiar with their individual ed plan or other documentation. So the process of being in college is to help the student be his or her own best self-advocate. The other quality we look for in our students, and as well in the faculty who um, work with our students, who teach our students, is the ability to be flexible. That just as your employment setting may change, um, so may a course. You may be introduced to a new book that you weren't expecting in that semester, or you may have a speaker <coughs> on a given day. So we look for that quality as well. And again, also that ability to have the emotional IQ, the empathy, to be able to say, you know, go meet, meet with your instructor during an office hour. Sit down, explain what some of your challenges are. Because instructors certainly can identify with learning um, and the challenges that their course may pose to the student. So. <coughs> I've done a lot of hiring over the years, both in uh, my current position. I've also worked a lot in the private nonprofit sector. Uh, when I look at a resume, like my colleague indicated earlier, I like it to be well put together, accurate, error free. But I get more excited about the cover letter because the cover letter to me tells me why that uh, job candidate uh, is a fit for the position because they may have skills uh, that they've developed in other types of positions that you may not think is relevant, but the cover letter is where you see 
is how they take a look at what they've got to bring to the job and make it fit for the job itself. Um, I also like to see excitement. Uh, when I interview, at the end of an interview, I want to hear somebody tell me, I want this job. Uh, uh, I, I want there to be a connection between the individual and the job. Uh, and that, to me, is the most successful job applicant for any of the positions that I've hired for. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have one more question, and um, and then we'll, if there is a quick question or two, we'll take it. But uh, just, uh, I'd like to talk now a little bit now. So the point is, they've gotten it through to you, that you like their resume, uh, and now there's kind of an interview process that goes on. So if you could just very briefly explain your interview process, uh, for the students, but also is is, is your process different uh, in some cases for individuals with disabilities? Um, you know, and what accommodation, if you have experience in doing that, do you make uh, for that position? So we'll go right down the road again. One thing we've started doing recently, because, you know, we get a lot of applications, and to sort of screen out, so we screen them out on paper first, and then the second thing we often do is we'll call them for a phone interview and just do a quick screening on the phone. You know, we'll call them and say, do you, are you comfortable with speaking now? If not, we can call you back. But, you know, don't have a really unprofessional message on your answering machine. We also look up, uh, if we are considering somebody, we, we Google them and we look up Facebook and all of that stuff. Be careful. Be careful. We've definitely screened people out for things like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, you don't want really loud music on your, you know, just on your answering machine, you know. Just keep in mind that in, in prospective employers could be calling you. Um, and in terms of the interview, again, some of the things that um, uh, Mitchell was saying, yes, you, you want somebody to really act like they care about the job and they really want the job. So when we have the in-person interview, and hopefully they're dressed appropriately. We do make some concessions for people if they seem really great that we'll talk to them about dressing appropriately because we know that if people have been unemployed for a while, they don't have any money. And sometimes they didn't need to have a business wardrobe. So, you know, we do um, talk a little bit about dress code, but people should look like they cared. They cared about being well-groomed when they show up. And you'd be surprised at the people that don't who are pretty good, who don't do that. So that's kind of important. Um, I guess that's it. So um, at, at People Incorporated, uh, it, it's rare that we are asked, our HR department is asked to make an accommodation, uh, but of course we would uh, around interviewing if necessary. Um, depending on the, the, the disability, um, you know, uh, all of our buildings are accessible, uh, you know, so, so actually access um, wouldn't be, uh, you know, an issue that we would need to go to great lengths to make an accommodation for, but we certainly would accept, um, you know, an interview uh, with uh, potentially a job coach or an employment specialist that was working with someone uh, that could, you know, you know, help the person through the, um, the, uh, the, the interview process. Uh, we provide that service uh, for a lot of the folks that we do um, find employment for. Um, and, you know, it's very, very person specific in terms of, you know, whether, you know, it's a good idea to have a job coach accompany you on a job interview or not. Um, and, and so I don't really have a, a, a general recommendation about that. Just that, um, you know, working with an employment specialist um, at the Career Center or at People Incorporated is a real benefit, um, and, it, and it helps you with a couple of things. One in particular is uh, what's called soft skills, those, those skills that you need to be recognized as a, a viable candidate in employment, um, how you're attentive, how you make eye contact. All of these seemingly you know, uh, minuscule aspects of, of interviewing that are really not minuscule at all. They're extremely important to an interviewer when, when you do speak. So when you, and I, I know that's part of the program in the grant as well, to, to, to learn those soft skills. Um, and the, the, you know, I just can't uh, emphasize enough how important they are uh, to, to be engaging. Um, it's not about you know, what, what um, accommodation you need. It's, it's about your, um, your, your being earnest about wanting the job. 
um, and, and how you were able to demonstrate that at an interview is, is really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. At BCC, every um, job applicant, when they apply to the college, will be made aware of the process if they are going to request accommodations during the um, application or in, and or interview process. And those could include access to an interpreter if the individual is deaf or hard of hearing. It might be a copy of the questions that will be asked at the time of the interview. Um, once again, we stress that the um, individual know what are the essential requirements, if it's a course for a student or an applicant, um, have they been able to predict what they may need at the time of the interview for accommodation so that one that applicant can explain and show what they know, not necessarily what they're not able to demonstrate at that point. Uh, working in a state agency, we have a very standardized uh, application process. Uh, all applications go through our human resources department first, just to make sure that somebody has met the minimum entrance requirements. Uh, once they would come to my desk, uh, I will generally interview most, if not all, of the candidates, depending on the number of applications I've gotten. I've only been asked in this position once for a reasonable accommodation, and generally it's the job candidate that will tell you that prior to the interview, but after the application uh, is made. Um, and that was for an interpreter. And, um, we had a, uh, the accommodation we had to make was both get the interpreter and reschedule uh, the interview for a time when the interpreter and the candidate could come. Uh, and in that case, the individual did get the position, uh, so it was well worth the accommodation uh, uh, required for the interview. Uh, but generally, it's the individual will ask for the accommodation uh, prior to the interview, but not necessarily disclose in their application. Thank you. And we're kind of bumping up on our time, but I did offer up the opportunity to have a question, so I want to honor that if there is a quick question from you. If not, then please, uh, I'd like to thank our employer panel, joining me in thanking them. That'd be very good. Change panels. If any of you folks would like to stretch your legs, grab a couple. Thank the members of the legislature who have been able to join us. Welcome my good friend Carol Sciola and Paul Schmidt. Um, thank them for attending. I know that um, periodically they may need to slip out and conduct other constituent and legislative business. So I want to thank them and welcome them once again to um, to uh, Bristol Community College. Um, I also want to just give you a sort of, you've seen some people buzzing in and out of here. It is not disinterested guests from the audience. We actually have in that classroom back there a certified nurse aid training program going on right now. So the students you see wandering in and out is probably just a class change during their academic schedule. So we uh, uh, ask your uh, sort of uh, uh, acceptance of that reflection in the program, and uh, I just wanted to mention that as a note of, of interest. So, let me turn the program over to Julie Godin and the second panel. Oops, let me get that almost close. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. So, my name is Julie Jodelin Krozik, and I have multiple roles on this grant. So I just want to introduce you first to um, today's role, which is to moderate this exciting panel of people who do work in Bristol County and have a disability and who are accommodated. Um, and can answer the number one question that our students had, which is, do you really hire people with disabilities in Bristol County? And the answer is yes. Um, in addition to this, I am also a customer service instructor with our program and um, a consultant on a grant for curriculum development, as well as a learning specialist in a classroom. So I am an employee of Bristol Community College and work out of our disability services office. First, I want each guest to introduce themselves, give us their name, where they work, and how their employer accommodates them. So Barry, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, 
My name is uh, Barry Bostock. I uh, work in two facilities. I work at STAR, uh, and I've been with them for 23 years. And I also, uh, I am over at Stepping Stone, I'm the assistant director of the men's program over there. Um, my uh, employer and how they've uh, been helping me is that they've given me a lot of guidance over the years. I've got a lot of wonderful people that have helped me. Uh, you know, there's nothing like hands-on. Uh, I believe that's the best way to uh, learn the job that, uh, that you're going into. Um, and that's how I adapted and learned it, uh, uh, the job that I do today. Um, my disability is uh, um, substance abuse. Um, I'm allergic to alcohol. Uh, when I drink it, I break out in handcuffs. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, <laughs> I've had some times in the correctional facilities, and um, I came to Fall River in 1988, and the house that I am now, uh, the assistant director toward, is the house that I went through on the class of 88, 89. And uh, thank God for those services. And uh, I've come a long ways, baby. <laughs> it's been a lot of years in the field, and. Uh, I have a lot of exciting things to share, but I also want the rest of the panel to share some, because I know we're short on time. So with that, uh, thank you so much. My name is Jean Pichico, and I work for the Forever School Department. I retired from Talbot Middle School. I am deaf now, but I can speak because I wasn't always deaf. I was born with a slight hearing loss, and I had lip reading through elementary, so I read lips. And I can speak because I remember how, how it was to speak, but I don't hear anything. I have a TTY phone and the cell, I use just the text. Right now, since I'm retired from the school department, I'm doing 21st century program after school. And uh, the kids, you'd be amazed how well, how well they adapt and how much they like to help me. I've been doing it for eight years, and I think being in the school department, working with the kids, showing them what it's like not to be able to hear, but still do a good job, and they love to help. So they're getting the experience, they're getting to see what it's like, they're getting to know people that are different. And some of them have a few problems too, so we all respect each other they're that way. You know, they respect me and I respect them. It really works out well, and I enjoy what I do. I hope I can keep doing it for a lot longer. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Leonard. I am employed by People Incorporated. I've been there, I want to say, at least five or six years. Um, I absolutely enjoy uh, the opportunity to be employed by People Incorporated. Um, like I said, um, it's, it's a great work environment, and I'm happy to be working there. Thank you. Well, they've answered all the questions already. You've already talked about how you add to the diversity of your workplace, and you've talked about your story, but some of our students wanted to know is, do you think there's a safe time, and we put that you know, very carefully out there, a safe time to disclose to an employer that you have a disability? And if so, can you tell us about that for yourself or someone that you work with? We'd really love to hear more. Okay, yeah, well, I was very fortunate enough to uh, be able to uh, come into the uh, agency at a young age. And uh, I was working in the mills when they had the mills there in Fall River. So getting a job wasn't that difficult for a guy like me. Um, I did have my GED, but I didn't have any job skills whatsoever. Um, my, uh, my schooling was uh, very, uh, not a whole lot of schooling. I had to get back at the GED. Uh, go to uh, mass rehab, and I did go through mass rehab, and I did take some courses at BCC early in the 90s. And when I got there, I got the meat, uh, I got the meat pad insulin. And uh, I remember the day I went into office, I was so full of fear. 
And uh, Pat has a way with herself. Uh, you know, she's very professional, and and I'm not used to sitting with people like that at that point in time. So uh, I explained myself to her, and she knew what I had been doing within the agency. I got in. Uh, I got into uh, volunteerism, and I started doing a lot of things within the agency. Uh, just, uh, talked about uh, my uh, alcoholism, and did groups in the, the facility, and spoke to a lot of kids throughout the uh, school system in Fall River about alcoholism in the family. Uh, so she was very understandable because she, uh, that's what they catered to, that population. So uh, she took a risk and uh, hired me, and that was in 1991. And, I didn't have a record, I had an album. <laughs> so, uh, all right, uh, there was a lot of stuff on that. And uh, nothing violent, but all alcohol and drug related crimes. Uh, I left uh, Ash Street in 1988, and I got, I got in recovery, and uh, I have not returned to any sort of crime since that time. So, I, I'm wondering if uh, alcohol had anything to do with that. <laughs> Thank you. I think the best time to mention anything is right at the beginning. Put it out there. You know, feel secure in it. Let them know that it's not going to make a difference. You're, you're okay with it. They should be okay with it and explain how and why, I guess, if they ask you, you have to explain how and why you can do your job with this disability, but it should be right out there. There's no safe time. It's right off the bat. You should let them know right away. And um, I really didn't have too much of a problem because at the time I was able to hear pretty well. So I got hired. I lost my hearing at 29 and it's getting worse and worse so that now I don't hear anything at all. But um, I think if the employer is really willing to give you a chance, you have to let them know that you're secure and you're secure with the fact that you can do it. I know I did. I told them right off the bat, I love working with kids. I've always wanted to teach kids. I've always wanted to be in the school department somehow. And they just got, they picked that up and I've been there ever since. I think that, like she said, that you should mention it right away because um, um, because if you're on a job and you don't tell the employer that you know you have a disability, then they're not really going to know. Um, That's right. One thing I do think that is important is to explain it right away, like you tell them. Like I know with me, on um, my job that I do, I can't lift heavy things. Um, so I had to explain that, that I am not allowed to lift heavy things because of my past medical history. Um, so it's important to explain right away, so that way, you know, in case you go into a job where say they ask you to do something, you know, and you can't really do it because you have a disability. It's good to explain right away that you have the, the you have the disability. And I also I also don't think that people should not hire you because you have that disability. That everybody should be able to work no matter what their disability is. say exactly what we're talking about in class. <laughs> How can you get an accommodation if you don't ask for one? But our students are also taking customer service skills preparation and we're wondering in the work that you have, what are some of the customer service skills that you think our students should really pay attention to and make sure that they've mastered while they're in the program? I'll start, I'll go back to Mary. Yeah. Um, well, I believe uh, for my field that I work in and the population I serve, uh, empathy is very, very important. You need to have compassion and understanding of uh, what these uh, clients are going through. And, um, you know, they, one of the things that, you know, they're coming into service and they're feeling very low about themselves. You know, they, they already got the stigmatized, on, uh, the stigmatized by their addictions and, 
ask. You know, I just, uh, I'm, I'm a person that is very uh, sympathetic and understanding of what's going on with these, uh, with, with the clientels and um, customer pro uh, approaching the clients in, a, in the right way means a lot. It says a lot about who you are. It says how you represent your agency and the quality of care that you're giving to, uh, to the uh, individuals that you're serving. It's a big piece. Got a smile. You know, have a positive attitude. Let them know there's hope, that there's a better way, right. that there is life after drug addiction. And uh, so I've been very blessed and gifted to have that ability to do that with the clientele that we serve. Okay, customer service. You need respect. You need empathy. Oh, I'm sorry. You need respect. You need empathy. You need to be able to deal with people without showing any, you know, discord or you have to be nice. Even if you don't want to be, that's right. Even if you don't want to be, you have to be nice because if these people, if they, even if they react in a negative way, it's not personal. It's not with you. You have to think that way. You have to remember that it's not you. It, they have a problem, you don't know what it is, so you still stay nice. And like, uh, like with my kids too sometimes, I have a problem with them sometimes, but it works out well because I just don't let it affect me, I don't get angry with them, and I, I think, well, geez, something must have happened to make him, you know, angry, and I just tell him, I just, I, I just say, we don't do that here in the classroom, and then I walk away, and they just stop. They stop. They're amazing. The kids are amazing. So all I know is you have to be nice if you're working with people in any customer service, anything. You have to be nice, and you have to be willing to help, and you have to remember that they may have problems of their own. That's all I can say. I'm sorry. I don't know if I can think of anything else. <laughs> um, yeah, it's important that... Um, you make sure you're very polite. Um, you have to realize that when you go into any field that there's going to be people with different personalities. And I think the one thing that I'd like to touch on is that, you know, when you step into a field, whether it be the residential field, whether it be the job that I'm doing, there's going to be people with different personalities. Not one person is going to have the same personality. But you have to realize that on the job, there's going to be struggles. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be, you just got to remain calm through that. And no matter what job you do, even if someone's rude to you, you don't want to be rude back to them because, you know, it just, it doesn't solve anything. You know, everybody has a bad day. Um, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta remain calm, and you just gotta respect the work that you do, and respect the other people, and realize that no one person is the same. Thank you so much for that advice. I hope our students are taking notes. <laughs> We'd like to switch gears a little bit now with the final question I'm going to ask, and then I'll open it up to our students and our guests. We have a variety of students in our classroom with different disabilities. So some students are bipolar. Some students have delayed processing. Some students have learning disabilities that impact their ability to pick up something quickly and show it on the spot. And they're wondering if you or someone you work with might have a similar disability, and what kind of accommodations do they get at work? Or do you have any suggestions as to how they can get accommodations so they can keep the job that they do get through the help of Karen? <laughs> we have, uh, you know, a lot of my uh, clientele that I deal with, they have a lot of the uh, issues that, uh, mm -hmm. that they're bringing to the I workplace. Don't. And, you know, it's working with individuals with the same issues as myself and a lot of the people that are coming into the field. You know, you gotta find the time for, you, for them. We get caught up in our work and all the things that we're required to do that we forget about that sometimes. And it's very important that you meet with people where they're at. It's the only way they're gonna learn. 
And some things, uh, some people are better th with certain things than others. And you have to, like I said, you have to meet with the individual, we'll see where they're at, and what, what are the things that they need to help themselves to learn the skills they need in the job that they're doing. Some people are able uh, to put that together, some people are not. I mean, you just have to utilize all your resources that you have available for the uh, person that either you're working with or the clientele that I serve. Uh, and that's one of, the, uh, one of the things that I've been able to do with the population that I work with and also with the people that I also work with. And it's nice to be in the field, being with people that understand the language that, uh, you know, we have this thing, uh, fellow uh, addicts and alcoholics, we all speak the same languages. So we know our fears, we know our insecurities, we know all those things. And I believe uh, all of us, once we are able to overcome this, uh, uh, the uh, different things that we do in our workplace, once we're able to do that, it does build up the self-esteem. And then you know you're capable of doing these skills and doing, these, uh, doing the job the right way. But it takes time. So with that. Okay, let me see if I get this right. Okay, now working in the school department, I get, I get kids with different problems and I always try to get their background before I start the class. I, get, I try to get their background so I, I'll know the best way to handle their problems, you know, which I'm not a counselor, but they're in my classroom and I can't treat them all exactly the same. They have these certain problems and I have to know about them. And I have to, um, I don't know, it, it's hard to explain. The first thing I do is I tell them about my hearing loss and I tell them that I can't always hear, so I don't always get everything all the time. And if I don't, and if I don't answer you, it's because I didn't hear you. So make sure you come up and pull on my sleeve or something, and then, you know, I will look you, look you in the eye and I can read your lips and I'll get the question. It's amazing how they want to help. And because they know I have a problem and they want to help me, they do their best and they, they tell me, well, you know, I have ADHD or something and I'll say, okay, we have to remember that. It's just finding out about each other would be the best way, I think, to handle anything in a group of people with different problems, uh, disabilities, whatever. <coughs> that's, that's just how I feel. That's the only way I feel, to get to know everybody. You know, you, you, you'll automatically just get along, really, because it works in my classroom. Um, just like anything, you have to be patient. Um, you know, I think that anybody with a disorder, right. you, can't, you can't approach it in a negative way. You have to be positive about it. You gotta try to help them through it. And that's right. I think that the kinds of accommodations on the job, you just gotta try to help them. You gotta be patient yourself and you gotta try to see them through it. Because if you don't help them or you don't see them through it and you're negative about it, that's really not gonna help them. So my main thing is to just be positive about it and try to help them out. I just have to say, I think he adds a lot of good things. He does really well. And you too, he got it off and he did it well. Very good. Thank you so much. It's nice to hear accommodations that don't cost a lot, that are really cost effective. But when you ask for them, they, you can get them. And employees don't have to be afraid to spend a lot of money to redo a room or to train their staff to be patient, to understand, and to sometimes just yeah. be able to allow a few more moments, or allow one person to talk at a time, or allow some patience in your staff. Excellent. Now I'm wondering if, if our guests, or if the students in the, in the room have any further questions for our panel of employees. Thank you. It was nice to hear from all of you from both panels because there's nothing like hearing from actual experience. And I want to ask you a question, Mark. Tell me what you like about your job and, you know, how, what would you tell someone who would want to do your job in the way that you do it? What advice would you give them? Well, 
I just tell them to approach it calmly. Um, you know, like I said, I'm very thankful. Um, I am employed. It helps. Um, you know, like I said, anybody going into a field, they can do anything if they put their mind to it. It's, it's not hard. You just got to sit back and think and, you know, and if you are having a tough time, you know, there are people you can seek out, you know, and you can get help for that. And, you know, like I said, it's a great job. Um, and, you know, I've had several people cover my job and I told them, I said, don't, don't be nervous about it. It's going to be a cinch, you, you know. I gave them some helpful pointers and, you know, you just got to remain calm going into any field, no matter what it is, you know. Um, that's it. I think it's easier um, to work rather than not to work um, because, you know, if you don't have a job, there's a lot of things that you struggle through. Uh, you know, like if you got bills and stuff and you got to pay stuff, I mean, it's not as easy. So I think that working definitely has its upsides and I think that people can benefit a lot from working and anybody even with a disability can benefit from working. Uh, it's, it's actually a positive thing to work. I think it's easier to work. I love the self-esteem I have from having my job. And I feel like a professional, which is wonderful. And it's easier because you're going out to do something, you're meeting new people, you're doing something different every day, and you're making friends. And you feel productive. And I just don't think I could sit home and not work. <laughs> I just, I like being out there. I like doing something. And I like helping kids. And I like, I like my job. I love my job. And um, I, I hope I can have it for a few more, quite a few more years. But it is much better if you're out there working instead of sitting home. Um, well, I gotta say, I've, I've been fortunate enough, I've never uh, collected any sort of disability. I uh, got right into the workforce as soon as I was uh, uh, completed phase one of the Stepping Stone program, I went right to work. Uh, one thing that I see happening with the population I serve is that uh, a lot of clients, you know, that they're addicted to the substance, but they're also addicted to the system. And if they get caught up in that, they're gonna, they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna stay stagnant. And one of the things I know, the more I do with myself and my job and, and anything that I do makes me feel good about me. And the more I feel good about me, the less I'm gonna think about wanting to use a substance. So if, they, if the people out there and they're not working and not being productive in their lives, go back to school, get in some sort of workforce. I, it's amazing, these, these clients, they wanna make uh, 15, 20 dollars when they stop. And I'm like, it doesn't work like that. You gotta start from the bottom and work your way up. Uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta do it for yourselves, for your families. And um, you know, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm one of the, uh, one of the few in my family that's been able to go back to school, get my certification in the field, uh, and do the things I've done. That's huge for me. It makes me feel good about myself and the work I do and the people I serve. 
Uh, I'm, I'm glad and I'm blessed to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And that's what this is all about for me. Uh, having a message of hope, let others know that there's a better way, that you don't have to settle for less, that there's so much more out there for you. You just got to get off your butt and get out there and do the work. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you again. Thank you, Mark, Jean, Mary. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Now I'd like to hand things back over to Paul. Very much. Thank you very much. I always feel so much better when I leave this building. I need to tell. <laughs> Well, Madam Secretary, thank you for coming again to Fall River. We appreciate the support that the governor uh, and his cabinet provide to this part of the Commonwealth. For a long time, it's been a forgotten part of the Commonwealth, except during your tenure. So thank you very much for coming and joining us. And Carol, uh, thank you again for your leadership with your colleagues in the legislature. Uh, true hometown person who loves Fall River, please Fall River and uh, works F uh, tirelessly for, on behalf of Fall River. So thanks for all you do as a legislator. You learned a lot. <coughs> I'm gonna brag a little bit. You know, because the conversation's been about uh, accommodation, reasonable accommodation, and, and the college has really tried to be part of that movement. So it's a humble beginning, and we're really at our infancy stage but I want to recognize the work that the dean does and that Julie does uh, over at the Office of Disability Services. I think we're creeping up on over 900 different students who use Disability uh, Services Students Office on an annual basis. Um, some of the numbers, you know, percentage-wise, they're misleading. Uh, we're up by 100% on serving people with hearing disabilities. Well, it's probably because those persons with that disability didn't have any place to go, and we now provide those services. So, same thing with individuals within the autism spectrum. You know, autism is such a new challenge in the workforce, and, and we're starting to uh, be able to understand better that workforce need and how we as a college can intervene in a positive way. So I want to commend the dean and, and acknowledge the work that she and Julie and her team do. <coughs> In, uh, in, uh, in, in keeping this issue in the forefront, because you need leadership, and institutions like community colleges uh, and legislatures can move the needle. So collectively, um, I'm very proud to be part of that team. I also again want to give a, a thank you and a, and a recognition to Dean Carmen Aguila, who leads this workforce uh, group down here, uh, to the worker bees and leaders of the herd management team to get that done, uh, Rob Vitello, uh, Nicolette Collage Andre and Jennifer Vincent, who I think are over yep. here, and Rob someplace did Rob over there, uh, and of course Sarah Brown, who is really the, the team leader on this particular project. And uh, I think that's it. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for uh, students. Thank you for uh, taking that step because uh, this last speaker I think really put out there. It's on you now. Um, no one needs to worry about the rear view mirror. Mm. Everybody needs to focus forward. And uh, <clears throat> through this opportunity, uh, you know you can make better lives for yourselves and for your family. So congratulations for taking that step. Yeah. We hope we can live up to the expectation that you have and you deserve to So thank you for coming. And thank you for having to work. Have a tour of the facility, so if any of you want to walk around and see what goes on here, uh, feel free to uh, the, the workforce.